Welcome to Giving an Answer, the show dedicated to defending the historic Christian faith. I am your host, H.C. Felder. Today the topic is morality and technology. And to discuss this with me, I have Dr. Kevin Staley. Let me tell you about Dr. Staley. He's actually a native of South Africa. He has a bachelor's degree in theology from Miami Christian University, a master's in apologetics from Southern Evangelical Seminary, my alma mater and a PhD in systematic theology from University of Free State. He's associate professor of theology at Southern Evangelical Seminary. And he has published a related article to this in the Christian Apologetic Journal on moral per perspectives for a possible post-human future. Welcome to the show, Dr. Staley. <laughs> Thank you very much, AC. Good to be here. Uh, what did I miss? Um, probably the mo maybe the most important part of my life, and that's my wife, uh, okay. Susan. Um, We've been married for 26 years, and she's a lovely woman. Uh, I hope to uh, for you to meet her someday. Um, but she actually, I did meet her. I met her at the, uh, at the at uh, the logos thing. Well, you did. That's right. Yeah. How could I forget that? <laughs> that, that great <laughs> yeah. training we had yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, she, she is uh, my my better half. Actually, probably would constitute more than just half when yeah, it comes yeah, to value. You're one of those guys that they say you know married up. <laughs> married up. Uh, that's. <laughs> Dr. Geisler would actually say that to me sometimes, and he, he, was, he was right. <laughs> he was right. He was right. So it's, it's a great honor to have you here. Thank uh, you. This is a topic that, uh, and I was just, just telling you, I was telling my wife, I said, you're never going to believe what this guest is going to talk about. <laughs> this is a topic I've done hundreds of shows, and I've never <laughs> done a show on morality and technology on the type of stuff that we're going to talk about now. So I'm excited. Yeah, yeah and, and it's a shame. And hopefully <laughs> it'll, it'll bring about a change in what is talked about in the Christian community because I think you'll see it's, it's very important. Because ever since we've discussed what you're going to talk about, I've been thinking about it. Right. <laughs> I've been thinking about it. And I was less like, wow, you know, this is, this is interesting. And I'm in IT. So oh, okay. I think about See, that. I'm actually, that. Yeah, I'm actually yeah. A, a software engineer by okay. day. Yeah, uh, I'm a career IT man myself. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, <laughs> so that's why I, this is fascinating to both of us, <laughs> I imagine. Right. That's right. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about morality right. and technology. So let's define morality first. Just, just kind of simply put it, uh, morality has to do with uh, human behavior, human actions, and, and how we categorize them. And you know, two broad categories are you know, good acts, bad, right or wrong. Uh, and so that's kind of you know, what morality deals with, is human behavior actions and categorizing them in those senses. Um, it's also important to, kind of re to remember when it comes to morality, we're not talking about it in a vacuum or in isolation. Um, human action and behavior emits from what I would say is the human heart, not the biological pumping organ, but you know, the, the, that which shapes our ideas, our concepts, our actions, our will, um, emotions, those things that that flow out of us, if you will, into how we, we interact with uh, other, you know, and it sounds generic, but created beings, you know, human beings, animals, uh, living things. Um, so it's not, you know, it's, it, it pertains to how we relate with these, these things around us. Okay, so then define technology. Okay, th this one's gonna, it, it's, it's gonna sound a little convoluted, but bear with me. Um, First of all, it's a distinct human cultural activity, so it's human activity, um, in which human beings exercise their freedom and their responsibility to form and transform natural creation um, with the aid of, and this is kind of where technology now seems to, you know, when, when we think of technology, with the aid of tools and procedures um, for practical ends and purposes. So, you know, very clinical kind of sounding definition, but essentially it has to do with hu human activity that's, that's uh, geared towards taking natural created things and with, with the help of tools and you know, procedures, processes that we might have, come up with things that we can use for practical ends and purposes. Um, ideally, tying it with morality, it should, you know, ultimately should be that what we're doing is for the good of ourselves and for the things that we are forming and fashioning. So you gave a definition. Give us just like a brief history of technology. <laughs> this, this is going to be the, uh, the Concorde jet uh, okay. flyover. Um, 
in, in previous talks, what, where I've started is the 1600s, not because technology and w the way I've described it didn't exist prior to that point in time. But what we see in the 1600s is kind of a, a, a greater emergence, if you will, of not only human beings' interest in nature, but their, their ability to examine it. So in the 1600s, we see instruments uh, coming t into existence, you know, telescope, uh, microscope, those sorts of things that, that allowed human beings to look more closely at, at nature, you know, that, that which is around them. Um, and so uh, that's what was going on in the 1600s. But as they began to examine nature uh, and using instruments to examine it, uh, so the focus fell on the instruments themselves and to make improvements to them. So now instruments became improved and the, and the focus of human ingenuity and, and creativity to make better instruments. Well, as you move into the 1700s, what you see now is a shift taking place. Human beings have, through the use of instruments, made discoveries. They've now seen things in nature that they didn't see before. Um, but what this has given them the ability to do is now that they understand nature a little bit better, um, it's given them the, the ability to exercise power over nature. And I'm not intending to imply that as a bad thing, um, but just that but they're now able to control it, if you will, or better regulate what's happening in nature because they've understood it better. Um, then we move into the 1800s, um, and what we see is uh, some of Newton's discoveries um, cast the, the universe, the cosmos, in a more mechanistic light. Um, you know, we've looked behind all the cracks and corners and into the substance of things, and we haven't seen spirit. You know, what we've seen is just matter or matter in motion. We've seen organisms. Um, and so a concept began to form, and this is kind of important because it shapes, I think, how things have gone with technology uh, in the future, is a mechanical understanding of how the, the universe operated, a void of any other kind of supernatural influence or being behind it when it's operation or it's in creation. Um, and an emphasis on, on the, the ability of human reason to understand, to control nature. And so what we see emerging from this then is, is an exercise of greater power and dominion over, over nature. And during this era, we also see um, in Western civilization especially, um, the rise of industrialization. Now you have factories uh, doing things and you're mass producing things. Um, you also see people congregating in cities. And because now no, we don't have rural, uh, although we do, but, but we see greater populations in cities, the very existence of that larger group of people in cities drives the need for other inventions. You have refrigeration to keep food uh, uh, self-contained without spoiling uh, in a city uh, versus you know, p picking it fresh in the farm. Um, so those kinds of things. Um, and so it, it necessitated even further technological development. Then we come to the 1900s, and it's very interesting. If you, if you look at, and as I did some research, you look at the, the books that cover the inventions and discoveries and instruments, and you know, all the way up through this point in time, it, it gradually is increasing, but could fit in a single volume quite easily. You hit the 1900s, and it's like an explosion just occurred. Yeah, it, it, takes, it takes multiple volumes to cover the things invented, the things that have been used and done uh, te technologically wise during the 1900s. In fact, you, in order to, to examine them, it, it almost makes sense to categorize them, you know, things that are used for transportation, things that are used in medicine, because right. it's so exponential and, and just takes off. Um, but the, the you know, benefits to all this, what we see happening is a reduction in, in what I'd say is suffering, and I don't mean to cast you know, manual labor and work as suffering, but less human effort, less sweat on the brow, if you will, to, to do things. Um, greater comfort. You know, I mean, con consider even us sitting in the studio. We, we, you know, we're not outside, in the, in the, you know, it's not you know, outside the, the sunset, but we, we wouldn't be in the heat. Um, we, we're in a controlled environment. Um, so we've, we've benefited tremendously. A, a great sense of comfort. Um, you know, few people want to return to the pioneer days and be out in the wilderness, you know, kind of foraging for food and you know, having to survive through harsh winters. Um, so a great deal of comfort. <clears throat> but what we, what we see, um, and this, is, this will end my summary of, of uh, the technological development, 
the last couple of decades, what seems to be happening is while all of these things have been going on in our control of nature, um, now what we're seeing is that the, the, the lens has been turned, if you will, the microscope is now on human beings. And what now is under examination is, is what can be done to enhance, improve, alter human nature. Um, and exercise mm. control over mm. human nature or tr transform and change it. Right. Um, and and that, that's opening up significant issues, moral issues that are, that are actually hitting, uh, hitting us at such a rate that it, it's almost b beyond the ability to, to draw up policies and come up with a, you know, what the right ethical position should be on something because the inventions are just happening so rapidly. That brings me to my next question. It flows right into my next question. So what is the relationship, if any, between morality and technology? Okay, that's a good question. Um, if we just, and I'm not going to go back and read it, but if we look back at what I defined as uh, morality being you know, our human behavior and, and acts towards those that we're in relationship with, and uh, you know, we, we kind of sometimes are myopic in our viewing and our relationship only being with human beings, but we stand in relationship with many things, you know, cre all of creation, we stand in relationship to it in some way, form or fashion, and how we treat it determines its good. Um, and so our acts and behavior affect all things. What we use, the, the, the procedures, the, the uh, implements, the tools that we use to aid us in forming and fashioning, um, because we're moral beings, have moral consequences. And so there's this connection because we're so closely knit with, with what it is that we're using our tools and procedures for that they have moral uh, consequences to them. Now, I know one of your focus or your main focus is in robotics. That's right. So let's talk a little bit about that, robotics and morality. What is robotics, first of all? all right. um, well, robotics is a branch of technology that deals with robots. So the, the next thing which this is my definition. You're going to find, you know, disagreement. Uh, well, you find disagreement on almost everything, but you'll find some disagreement on a working definition for a robot. But this is mine, and I'll explain it a bit. Uh, my definition of a robot is the mechanical, and we can put a parenthetical, artificial, the mechanical r replication of biological functions. Um, initially, when I was thinking of my definition, I was going to say human biological functions. You think of a robot like a, you know, on an assembly line that resembles a yeah. human arm, you know, yeah. riveting, stamping. Um, but even in today, there are odd inventions of robots on a small scale that would be able to reprogram DNA within, within an organism. And so it, it's, not a, it's not resembling a, a human function, but it's resembling some biological function. So that's why I kind of took out the, the, the human qualifier and just said biological function. So it's a mechanical um, effort to, to replicate biological functions. So what type of robots are already around and what are they being used for? Okay. Um, I'll give you four, four categories. The first one that's been around for a while, and, and, I, and I don't have specific dates to give you, but I'm sure probably the 40s, 50s, maybe even prior to that, industrial robots. Um, and those are quite prevalent in industry, you know, being used to, you know, as I mentioned earlier, ri you know, rivet um, things on cars, put things together, lathes, you know, mechanical lathes that are robotic lathes that are caught machining um, parts and things. Um, so we see industrial robots used for assembly and packaging, welding, painting, robots that paint. Um, then security robots, robots that are used to defend and also enforce. So you have uh, robots that will handle uh, dangerous you know, chemicals or weapons, um, remote controlled weapons carriers, you know, surveillance. We all have you know, drones. We're all quite aware of drones and their use today. Um, uh, patrolling the robots that patrol the border. In fact, I read a story just recently about a company that was going to uh, donate and give to Israel. Uh, a, a, a robot that would, would, would uh, an armed robot, not just a robot for surveillance, but an actual armed robot that would patrol it. You know, it didn't look like a person, but it, it looked like a vehicle of sorts um, that was going to patrol the border, um, you know, looking for um, you know, s activity that I guess, you know, however it would deem falls in the category of, of, of a threat. Um, then medical robots, and that's been a tremendous, um, the, the uh, I think it's called the Da Vinci robot that, uh, in fact, they had at the, a local festival on display that's used by surgeons to perform surgery in, in microscopic uh, terms, but with great precision. 
um, used to monitor as well the health uh, and well-being of, of patients uh, dispensing medications. Um, and then the, the last area that I'm going to bring up is personal robots. Uh, in fact, of all the robots, a, a survey was done or a study was done in 2008 that, that said that 8 million robots to date had been produced. Of those 8 million robots, the estimation was that half of those robots were personal robots. Now, what are personal robots? Anything like pets, you know, that, that a robot pet, uh, a toy, worker robots like vacuum cleaners, then you run around the house yeah. uh, and, and clean up for you, uh, program, robotic mowers, um, concierge that might greet you know, somebody in the lobby of a hotel and give them directions, instructions around the hotel, um, education. Um, Japan has some robots that they're using to provide instruction in the classroom. And, uh, and Playmates, and this is somewhat of a sensitive, top sensitive topic, but I'm, I'm not going to get into details, but uh, the industry is driving tremendous money in this uh, area, and that's uh, robots for the purpose of sex. And so we see um, you know, that kind of a, a development happening in, in uh, personal robots. So. A, a, a definitely a burgeoning category that that's, uh, has tremendous interest and a lot of investment is in these personal robots. I got to tell you, I, I, when I think of robots, I think of, do you see the movie I Robot with Will Smith? <laughs> that movie freaked me out. <laughs> 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 so what is the, I mean, how realistic is that? What is the current state of the technology? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, actually, one of my, uh, and I enjoyed it, one of my assignments as I did research was to see what Hollywood was portraying for robots. So I got to see most of the, <laughs> most of the movies with robots. And, oh, yeah. But, that, but yeah, uh, I, I know, and that's, and that's where I, I try to bring a sense of realist, uh, realism to you know, what realistically is going on in, in society today to these and not just you know, make it fantastic because then people will think, well, that's, you know, that's not happening, so why is it relevant to me? But um, you'd be surprised. Um, the, the, pro, the, pro, the progress that's been made in the category of what I'd say are humanoid robots is significant. Um, you know, we don't have one that's functioning like you described, uh, but Asimov is a robot that's produced by Honda. And that robot, um, you know, in, fu in function resembles a, a, a human being. Uh, doesn't, you know, you wouldn't mistake it for a person, but it you know, has the form and function. And it can run, it can jog, it can move around, it talks, it speaks in you know, Japanese, uh, you know, it's because it's a Japanese robot. Can it robot. Can have a conversation? It, it can, can converse with, with people. Um, in fact, I watched one little clip where they had it at a show, and it was interesting to see the comments of the people who were at the show, one, one ranging from young people to older people, commenting, gee, I wish, uh, you know, I, wish I had one because, you know, it, I could I could talk to it and play with it and, and have it as a friend. I mean, it was uh, doing a very good job. Uh, wow. And so that's probably at this point the prime example of one. But there are there are many others, and there's a lot of there's a lot of research and a lot of money going into developing robots like that. So, what are the more issues involved with robots? Um, probably some of the significant things about robots, especially those that are going to play more of a role in human society uh, is the question of autonomy. And that is uh, when a robot reaches a state of development where w we deem it able to decide on its own, um, so it's, it's no longer you know, controlled by human beings, um, that's one issue. That's, that's one moral question is should robots be autonomous? Should they be free at some point to do what it is that they would do? Um, Another is uh, the issue of responsibility. Um, you know, if I buy a robot <coughs> and it comes you know, geared to, to, to pro program to do certain things, but then I alter it and it does something that harms someone, is the manufacturer of the robot uh, responsible for what it did? Or am I, because of what I did and changing or altering it? Um, that, that's, that's one. Uh, and then the other would be, um, how, what, what the ramifications are going to be of relinquishing control to, to robots or to artificial intelligence, uh, I'm going to say appliances, just for lack of a better way of describing them. Um, and for instance, there was a, there was a couple of years ago a, a very sharp dive in the stock market, and it was because artificial intelligence uh, engines are behind some of the trading that goes on, and there was an issue. No one, no, one has, no one found what the issue was because a system like that has millions of lines of code and right. it's so complex. You know, it's the product of teams of people. Um, 
that there was no real known cause and flaw. And so, um, kind of a humorous example is um, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the show The Office, but there was one. Episode, oh yes, I've there, seen there, there every was, episode. There was one episode where Michael drives into a lake and he blames it on the GPS. The GPS, the GPS and, told him to turn, and, and, and he turned. And, and, and my point being, when when we start having uh, devices or robots that possess a level of intelligence that we come to trust and rely upon what the consequences might be of either not being able to validate and verify that what they're doing is correct and accurate with no bugs or flaws I and mean, we all have computers and we know how that is that you yes. know, that there's flaws um, and so relinquishing you know kind of r uh, oversight um, is something that i think is, is should be concerning to us yeah i was i was stuck in chicago airport for two days because this system crashed because the airline system crashed and there were plenty of airplanes they just didn't know how to tell the airplanes to get where they needed to get to that's right and i was <laughs> oh i was not a happy camper but that's a show for another that's a topic for another day but which which of these robots are you most concerned about and why well well actually where my research wound up well it didn't really wind up going i sort of started there but is is what i would call humanoid robots and they, they, these are robots that um, are intended for um a presence amongst human beings. Um, I'm concerned about that, and it's it's not because I mean, we, if you work in a factory, there's a robot on the assembly line. It, it's it's not that, but what it is is the intentional development of robots that that not just function as human beings, but resemble human beings. Um, and and I'll give you one area of application that that ought to be concerning to all of us, considering the. The, the number of people in, in our population that are aging and getting near the point of needing some sort of elderly care. Um, and that is um, what one, one target uh, market, um, Japan's working on things in this, in this regard and, and even here, to establish caretakers, if you will, that would be able to function in the place of human beings for the elderly. Um, now, on paper, it seems to make a lot of sense. We've got a growing elderly popula population. We've got a shrinking population of, of younger people able to assist right. and provide care in the elderly care facilities. And so what, what better um, avenue for deploying something that would, would serve that purpose um, than a place where there's a, where, where there's a tremendous vacuum, if you will, and need for, hu for a human presence. And that would be in caring for, the, for someone like that. And so, um, but that concerns me because for a couple of reasons. <laughs> One is that we're human beings, and we're 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 uh, wired in a way that we relate with other human beings, and that's how we how we ought to relate. And so, when we introduce um, something like that, uh, a robot into that role, we've done a, we've done two things. Uh, we, we, the, the one thing that we only often see is you know, what are the consequences for uh, for someone who now this is the person that they relate to as a robot. Um, but the other side of it is, and especially in the, like the caregiving side, is if I, as the person who would otherwise have been responsible for the care of this person, now relinquishes that to a robot, I'm actually, I'm missing something. I'm missing out on something. Right. And that right. is the responsibility in, in a rela relationship to care for someone else and to give the, farm that care off. I'm actually missing out, you know, the, 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 I guess... You know, some people's perception would be I, I really couldn't be bothered to, to, with the hassle of caring for my elderly grandparents. But, but the, the, the change and the impact, it, the impact it makes in the life of the caregiver to offer care uh, is tremendous. And, and to, to, to give that up to a robot is to miss out on that development that takes place within us, within our character, within our relationship, to, to concede it to a robot. So that's just one, for instance, where I... You know, it's very interesting you say that, and let me, let, me, let me phrase this correctly, because I've been thinking about this, not, not as far as the robots are concerned, but as far as society is concerned in general. And what I'm trying to say is this. I look at our society and how everyone wants to be independent of everyone else. Right. And when we look back over our history, before there was, for instance, um, uh, Medicaid, or there was... Um, uh, Social Security, when people became elderly, elderly, they moved in with their children. So you may have three generations in one household. 
you don't have to do that anymore because of social security and government benefits, but it right. takes away something from the family unit. That's, that's right. The family unit no longer is as strong as it was because people are as close as, as they were because they don't have to be as much that's now. Right. And so that goes along with what you're saying is that where's this human interaction of mm -hmm. me leaning on you, you leaning on me, us leaning on one another, that's one of the things that it means to be human, right. isn't it? Right. See, it's, it's one thing, and in, in, in my quick overview of technology, it's, it's one thing to alleviate the burden that's upon us because of nature and the corruption that's in nature and, you know, and the, the difficulty by which we have to come by things to eat and to clothe us, ourselves. And it's one thing to relieve that which, which is a burden upon us, but, you know, and I'm not discounting at all the, the value of work, but I'm just saying that, that in lightening the load, that's one thing, but what's happened with with in the direction we're going with these sorts of things is the the whether it's explicit or not, it's implied that you're a burden, and yeah. and, yeah. and that and that what what I need is something to alleviate that burden, and when we start seeing one another as burdens, now we're in my book we're we're getting into some very d dangerous ground. I mean we're we're already in a culture of death, as as some ethicists have described it, where. Um, Anyone that's perceived, you know, the, the, the elderly, if you read some of, the, uh, some of the news headlines and stories, elderly people are committing suicide because they feel like they're a burden on those that have better things to do. Um, that, not should, that shouldn't be so. That's, that's, that's degrading human dignity and, and our humanity. We, we only have a, a minute left. Could you give us what you would use as recommendations and, and why? Um, for guidelines of this type of stuff. Right. Um, well, I, I really, the, the, the guidelines for humanoid robots are, are too extensive um, for okay. me to c cover in the time that's left, but um, I would like to say this to, to you and to, to the viewers, and that is this. W we need to be, in, and you mentioned it earlier, it's, it's, uh, that you haven't had a show on this before uh, is not a bad reflection on you. It's, 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 a, it's a shame for the, for the Christian community, and I don't want to you know, be shaming people, but it's, right. it's, it's, a, it's a disappointing thing, but it's something we can correct, and we need to correct, because we need to be looking at much more critically, wisely, from a biblical perspective, um, and we can bring other perspectives for, for those that wouldn't subscribe to a biblical perspective. We need to bring uh, to bear uh, caution and wisdom to how we use and deploy our, the devices that we're inventing. Um, we need to take a look and consider what their purpose is, what their use is, and even when we're using them, be careful. Um, I'm sure you've, you've run across, and I've been guilty at times too, you, 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 you'll be in a, in a public place where otherwise you would have had interaction with somebody maybe in line at a grocery store, and what are they doing? They're stuck on, on their, their phone. phone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, it, could be, it could be an emergency, it could be something critical. But when, when our technology becomes an end rather than a means to an end and we start to relate to it rather than through it, we're, we're, we're missing out on, on what I think we're designed to be and that's relational beings. That's a great note to end on. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Staley, for talking with me about morality and technology. Thank you. And that will end this episode of Giving an Answer. Be sure to join me. And until then, goodbye and God bless. You can find out more about Giving an Answer, as well as listen to other episodes by visiting us online at www.givingunanswer.org.